Okay, welcome to today's class, which marks the end of the first week of this course, CLT 362, Literature and Ideas about Machiavelli and Machiavellian. We started the week with a question implied in the example of the autocomplete answers provided by Google when, and you can try yourself, of course you'll have slightly different answers, when I typed all politicians are, all kinds of awful things came out as possible answers, which means those are the most frequent kinds of input words that were used by users. The implied question is, why do we find this popular perception that politics is a dirty business and that all politicians or most politicians are crooks. We then went on to examine a famous example from game theory called the prisoner's dilemma and we tried it in class. As you know, in this game, the best form of collaboration would be for both to stay silent, both the criminals who have been locked in a cell without communication with each other. The most predictable kind of behavior would lead to a brief stint, actually. I forgot to include one. possible outcome. So both prisoners stay silent, they both get one ear for kind of a lesser charge, and the other outcomes are once again a kind of collaborative outcome in which both denounce each other and an outcome based on cheating to take advantage of the other trying to talk while the other guessing the other will stay silent will produce six years and you experience these different results when we tried and I randomly coupled students to see how much jail time you would get we also had, during the week, another example that is reported also in the syllabus, the example of a minor, really minor act of cheating, whereby someone sees a sign that says the garage is full, monthly passes only, and even though this person doesn't have a monthly pass, they push the button, get a ticket, and get into the garage, simply because they want to park there, and cheating is their means to obtain that result. So today we'll go through this diagram that I put on the board and its meaning to have from the very beginning a general idea of the model that in my interpretation can be extrapolated from the prince if you want to make sense of the prince, if you don't want to just stay on the surface of this little book. And we'll then briefly use this in application to the three issues that are listed on this side of the board. To try to briefly explain the perception of politics as a dirty business, to go back and reassess the prisoner's dilemma and whether or not it can be seen as a Machiavellian game, and also we will re-examine this minor act of cheating in light of what we learned from this explanation. If there is time, I have a video, as I promised, on Friday we would watch videos 
or scenes from movies. I have one ready, but we'll see how much time there is. Maybe we'll be able to watch a few minutes of it and then you can continue at home. You find if you, if this is your first class for you, keep in mind that the class is not on Blackboard and you will find it on my personal domain, andreafedi.com. And then you can either put slash CLT362 inside your browser and you'll be redirected to the website, to the wiki of the class. The direct address would be andreafedi.com slash M-A-K, the beginning of Machiavelli, the evil version of the name of Machiavelli. I posted so far the digital audio recordings of Monday's and Wednesday's lecture. I have videos almost ready of Wednesday's lecture. I wasn't able to complete the editing of the video. So videos will be posted of Wednesdays and today's lecture at some point between now and Monday. If you're, especially if this is your first class and you have any questions for me, keep in mind that I have another class after this one in the same room. So I have a break of about 20 minutes and I can talk to a few people as needed. So let's examine this. We said whatever, however little you know about Machiavelli, you can agree that Machiavelli's focal point, the main issue in The Prince and in all of his intellectual endeavors is power. Of course, we could also say political power. It would be necessary to add political power because, as I suggested on Monday, Machiavelli did very little to expand his system in the direction of the personal lives of the people of his time. There is a quick reference to the possibility of applying his rules to success in life in general. There is one play that was very successful, the Mandrake Route, that we will examine at some point briefly, where the characters, the main characters, are acting in a somewhat Machiavellian way. But you don't find all of the system there. However, the class is exactly about the expansion and the application of Machiavellianism to different areas of life, and that's why we will leave power without any modifier on the board. Yes, please. Um, when, you mentioned, when you mentioned that there's like a, a brief bit in The Prince where he kind of t talks about kind of more general success, is that, is like, do people like kind of take that out of context in the way that people will like misinterpret Shakespeare or the Bible or like, just kind of misappropriate his work? No, not really. From the very beginning, the jump was quick and easy from the just the general spirit of the book to its application to individual outcomes or goals to be obtained by cheating, by lying, by being duplicitous, by being manipulative. So whether you look at the Elizabethan age or later literary works or philosophical treatises, anyone assumes that this application is possible and uh, doesn't require a lot of steps. And this is true to this day, right? To the most extreme examples, some of which uh, you might find listed in the page with ideas for the paper I mentioned. For example, this book from, I believe, 2016 about managing your kids in a Machiavellian way. Okay. And, and there is irony in, in these works, no doubt, of course, also. Or, or applying 
Machiavellian is to fashion and, and dress it up in a Machiavellian way. So we start with this, the idea that any kind of Machiavellian system is about power. Okay, so if power is not involved in some way, then we're not in a context where the application of Machiavelli's ideas make sense at all, okay? However, power is a very loose term. And Machiavelli, someone mentioned the word pragmatism in the free association that we did on Monday. Machiavelli was indeed a very pragmatic intellectual and a very pragmatic individual and therefore it's necessary to specify what we mean by power and the best way is to say that for Machiavelli in the context of his treatment of the concept of power, power is seen as equivalent to control. What does it mean? It means the ability to control the outcome of the game, the outcome of an activity, which of course implies that you start with a goal, right? And it is understandable in the frame of this pragmatic approach to the deployment of power. We're not talking about an abstract, a philosophical interpretation of power. We're talking about the deployment of power. We're talking about the use of power, the use of strategies. So it's a fair assumption that in order to identify something as Machiavellian, as applicable and compatible with Machiavelli's ideas, you have to have a situation in which you start with a goal, therefore you have an outcome that you want to obtain, and you exercise control that you have, or you gain control, or you increase your control in order to obtain that outcome. And of course, Quite often, in order to control the outcome, you need to control other people, other individuals. But I place that on the side exactly because otherwise we would fall prey to the usual misinterpretation of the Prince and, Machia and the Machiavellian system, uh, reducing it down, bringing it down to simply lying to other people, manipulating other people or killing, eliminating other people in order to obtain your goal, which may be the case in certain situations. It is certainly the case in a lot of examples provided by Machiavelli, simply because those were the kinds of situations in which controlling the outcome made it necessary, in Machiavelli's view, to resort to the most extreme measures, okay? Everything is related to a situation or a context. And that single word, context, which I purposely didn't put on the board because it will be the focus of so many of our classes and lectures in the future is one of the revolutions brought by Machiavelli, introduced by Machiavelli in the field of political activities, political practices, the deployment of power. That is to say, the misinterpretation is that Machiavelli simply advocated cheating or supported the idea of evil 
apply to any kind of political behavior, activity, any kind of political practice. Whereas Machiavelli predicated the success of any strategy on the qualities of a context. And therefore, evil is what might be necessary in a certain kind of context. Unfortunately, it was, according to his view, the preferred strategy in a Renaissance Italian context. And it's understandable, because throughout most of his adult life, Machiavelli lived in a society that was either at war, under the threat of war, or where the exercise of local freedoms, local liberties, however limited they were to a small elite in a city-state such as Florence, was subjected to the influence, was subordinate to the authority of another country, of another government, of a foreign country. Okay? So, the first thing we can say is that Machiavelli never advocated evil ways and their various incarnations as the principal way of dealing with political issues. He simply brought to the attention of the reader a lot of situations, a lot of contexts, a lot of examples where that was considered by him the best approach, the best way to reach the desired for a desirable outcome. But if you change the context based on his very own system, that evil might be the worst approach, the worst way to achieve the outcome. It's easy to imagine that if you replace the dark history of the Italian Renaissance, where, as I mentioned before, in 1494, Italy was invaded by the army of Charles VIII, King of France, who brought with him a few dozen of very powerful cannons who lay siege to a number of Italian towns, and if they refused to open their gates and surrender, he entered the town with his soldiers and did things such as cutting the right hand of men who were able to be recruited as soldiers, killed the operators, the professionals who worked on the artillery inside the city so that they couldn't in the future rely on their expertise to defend themselves from an invading army. If you replace that kind of situation which prolonged itself through the entirety of the rest of Machiavelli's life between 1494 and when, when Machiavelli was 25 and 1527 when he died, this state of war, uh, intermittent but constantly looming on the horizon, was the norm, and this situation continued until the 1550s, eventually with the loss of freedom in, and, and independence in a lot of regions in Italy. If you replace that situation with our own society, which and our own political games, which are heavily dominated by the use of the media, then you see that certain strategies are not applicable, are not useful any longer, right? A certain kind of cheating is not allowed in a Machiavellian framework these days simply because you're surrounded by people with smartphones who can take a picture or a video of you doing something that will harm your image, right? Take the example of Sarah Palin in, in recent days and how she was photographed 
in a restaurant in New York in violation of the rules pertaining to the need for vaccination, testing, etc. You, you cannot get away with it as easily as, for example, in the 19th century when it was much easier to control the media because the media mean, meant newspapers and magazines, a, a limited number of them owned by members of the elite who were connected with the politicians. Louis. So he's not really casting a, a moral judgment on any of the plans. He's really just trying to comment on the practicality and how effective. Exactly. Are. Exactly. Because you can, because so when, you when we talk about evil, country. he's saying the issue of the morality of the actions of the politician is secondary and often irrelevant because the first thing is whether or not you get your outcome. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I was interrupting you. But uh, like, say someone tried to uh, invade a country and do what Charles and start cutting off the hands. He couldn't get away with that because we have such a chain of information today that the whole world would cast, uh, would simply go against them based on morality alone. If you ruin your image, then that will affect your ability to use deterrence. You will have to use force more often and that will be more expensive to you and ultimately might ruin your political career. So, especially in today's world, it's vital to maintain a positive image. Even when you're, you have different kind of deals in the back, but you have to reduce the possibility of exposing those back deals. Because otherwise, without a good image, then it doesn't matter how much force you have, you will not be able to use it effectively. You will not be able to use it to increase your amount of control. Okay. And again, as I said before, this is just the introduction to a series of rules, so to speak, that we will try to track in the chapters of the prince, in examples from books that try in one way or the other to apply Machiavelli's ideas. So we will return and re-examine all of them. So we said Machiavelli is about power. His idea of power is control and control means control of the outcome, which means that you have a situation where you have a goal of some kind, which might be a positive goal that you introduce yourself in the context or a critical issue that makes you devise a goal which would be to restore your power in that situation to address the issue, to reduce the problem. In order for this to be Machiavellian, we also need to be able to obtain the outcome for similar kind of situations or contexts in a predictable and in a repeatable way. And the outcome must be somewhat necessary. What does predictable mean? In order for something to be defined not as a Machiavellian act in the popular sense, meaning someone is cheating to get what they want. But in order for somebody, something, an activity or a practice to be defined as a Machiavellian game, something authentically Machiavellian, obtaining the outcome must be predictable. That is to say that most of the time, by deploying a certain strategy, I will obtain a positive result for me or for the people involved or any leader who initiated the political activity, or in this case, a criminal or a civilian, etc. Now, keep in mind that predictable is different from certain, okay? So Machiavelli understands very well as a humanist that there cannot be any certainty in human activities, okay? So for something to be defined as a Machiavellian game, 
I need to be able to say that I will predictably obtain the same outcome within the same kind of context most of the time. So I'm not sure of the outcome, but I'm sure enough. I'm almost sure. So you can see where I'm going, for example, in reference to criminals, in reference to the single individual cheating his way into the parking garage of the administration, or a politician trying to cheat to further their career. Repeatable, as I said before, a game, a strategy, a practice cannot be Machiavellian if it is a one-off strategy. Has to be repeatable, however, repeatable in the same kind of context or in a similar context. If the context is, is vastly different, then the same strategy will not give you the same outcome. And again, this is the single most important notion that you find in Machiavellian and the easiest to overlook throughout his book because your attention is caught by all these examples of princes, dukes, counts who are killing each other, poisoning each other, eliminating their enemies, calling for their enemies to come into their town for a peace agreement and then hanging them or uh, uh, cutting their throats. So the outcome has to be, the, 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 the game has to be repeatable. And this time the different sign calls our attention to the fact that repeatable doesn't mean ad libitum. That is to say, as many times as you like. No, it means as many times as needed. Because in Machiavellian strategy has to be cost effective, has to imply the notion of necessity. And this by itself takes away any idea that Machiavelli provided simply an apology for evil behavior or advocated for the use of violence in any kind of situation. Because it's not saying that whoever, like the prince, the ideal prince, has a lot of force, can do whatever they want, using any means they choose and obtain the outcome they want, they desire, over and over again. No, they are limited themselves by the necessities of the political game. So the typical Machiavellian prince may kill someone whom they consider a competitor, a political adversary, whose elimination may be convenient, useful, and practical. However, they cannot do whenever they want and any time they feel like. They can only do every time it is necessary to obtain the outcome. If they did that out of the necessity of the situation, then they limit their amount of power. They endanger their control of the situation. For example, by affecting in a negative way their image or by influencing their subjects in a negative way, because of course, fear is a word that you will find mentioned a lot in The Prince. There is a famous passage that you also find in a scene from A Bronx Tale, the film directed by Robert De Niro from 1990 with Charles Palminteri, where Chas Palminteri, who plays the part of a local mafioso, says, it is better to be feared than to be loved. It would be better if it was possible to be loved, but you have no control through love. 
Fear gives you control of other people. However, as I said, if you deploy force in the form of violence too often, that will be costly politically. It might be costly in terms of resources, because if you have a gang of criminals or if you have an army every time you send them out, it is costly, but it will cost you also in an indirect way because if you adopt murder or torture as the most common instrument to control a community or a society, at some point people will not be afraid any longer. If being murdered, being sent to prison for political reasons, being tortured becomes prevalent or is perceived as a possibility in the lives of too many citizens, then they will not be afraid of you any longer. Then you will not be able to switch from the direct use of force to the use of deterrence, which means don't do anything to me because I have force I can deploy again. If I deploy every time, then I will not be feared any longer. Right? So the very idea that you have in this system, the notion of necessity, tells you that Machiavelli did not support simply the use of evil behaviors and practices. The opposite is true. That is to say, Machiavelli will tell you, will tell leaders, just a moment, that if you're not willing to use evil ways, when it is necessary, then you will fail. If you want to be honest, when honesty will impact negatively in, on, on the outcome of the situation, then you will fail as a leader. You have to be good enough because you have to be able to retain a positive image that is key to the exercise of power in a resource effective, in a resource light way, but you have to, you'll have to be able to switch to any means that the context requires to obtain the outcome, including lying or, or murder, if the situation dictates it. Yes. And uh, what's your name, Matt? Nigel. Oh, Nigel. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. It's so. Yes, but then it says fear is the only way to really have control. So it starts with an ideal statement. It would be better. It would be ideal to be loved. However, fear is the only way to really control but isn't the people be around. Honest, be loved because, uh, like, have your policies in the line that people would love you because people loving you too much wouldn't lead to a revolt, but people fearing you too much will eventually lead to your downfall. No, yes, of course, he says, so as, we'll, as we will see in chapter 19, in other chapters, he will say, if you use fear too much, you will generate hatred. And you don't want that, because again, you will have ruined your image. However, he's very clear in saying that through love, you have no control over your subjects. Through love alone, you have no control over them. So, it's a game, okay? But keep in mind the outcome of a Machiavellian game. When you deploy a strategy, the outcome must be repeatable, the outcome must be predictable, and the outcome and the means adopted, deployed to reach that, must have some necessity in that context. Of course, you know some of that through the popularized notion of movies about crime, and especially movies about the mafia. What is the typical phrase, I'm about to kill a member of my own gang, or a member of my own family, or a friend, and I say what in, in countless movies? I'm sorry, Pa, what am I saying to Nothing this guy personal. before Nothing killing personal. him? Nothing personal. Nothing personal. It's 
It's what? Business. It's business. Now, this is the movie, the Hollywood rendition of this idea of necessity. I'm not killing because I'm an animal, a beast, a violent criminal who enjoys killing other people. If I were, I couldn't reach my outcome often enough. I'm doing it out of necessity. And that's the nature of the business. And that's the foundation of the likability of the characters in The Godfather, right? For example, in part two of the Godfather trilogy, the emphasis is on trying to justify how someone who was a regular uh, individual turned into a criminal out of necessity. The first movie as well, where Al Pacino, Michael Corleone, is a decorated war hero. He would like to have a career in the regular world, yet there is an attempt to kill his father, Marlon Brando, and therefore he has to act and become like a mafioso, become a mafioso, or take the, the, the third act of the trilogy and the famous uh, scenes, scene where Al Pacino said, they pulled me back in, <laughs> right? Just when I was about to get out and become a regular businessman, they forced me to resort to criminal ways. There is this idea of necessity, right? It's not because I'm a sadist that I'm killing other people or maiming them or torturing them. It is in the nature of the game because I have an outcome, I have a goal to achieve, and the only way to control that outcome is for those situations to kill someone. And in fact, what is one stylistic feature in all three of the Godfather movies, and we will watch some of the scenes. In reference to murders, what is the pattern, the stylistic or narrative pattern in those movies? Anyone remembers? Um, there's a lot of I mean, I'm amazed, I suppose I mainly think of the score here, but like there's a lot of, you know, just kind of minor key, like horn fanfare, whenever, like, say, Michael kills somebody or Vito kills somebody. Or, uh, oh, there is a music background yeah. that is uh, in contrast to, to this, right? Why uh, you go to the police? Why didn't you come to me first? <laughs> but how are the murders distributed in those three movies, usually? Meticulously. No, they're patched up. So there is a lot of tension. They're about to go to war with other families. But when it comes to typically Machiavellian murders of members of the family, members of their mafia family, and enemies, they're usually concentrated in one scene where there is the, they edited all the various killings and they put them together. And a lot of the movies instead is about the family, right? So the message is clearly, these are regular people. They have a family, they have family relationships, they care about their kids, they care about their wives. But then there are moments when they need to turn into murderous criminals. However, it's limited because they don't do that instinctually. They don't do that because it's in their blood. They do it whenever it is necessary to protect their family, their business, to maintain their power, etc. Okay. And then often the music comes in to attenuate the effect of those killings. Oftentimes you don't see a lot of blood. Uh, the, the scene goes quickly to the next murder uh, and so on. Because the idea is that however much violence is used, it is used out of necessity. And even when you do find a beast, a sadist, um, as the character of Dante in a later book by, uh, and film, uh, book by Mario Puzo, The Last Dawn, or Luca Brasi in the first movie, the, the big guy who, who offers his respect to the dawn at the beginning of the film, they themselves are instruments 
governed, controlled by the higher echelon of the mafia. That is to say, they are deployed whenever necessary. And their sadism, their proclivity, their inclination to violence becomes useful in certain situations. So it's not the norm. Okay? So predictable outcome, we want a repeatable outcome, we want this to be necessary because only if it is necessary the deployment of a strategy becomes cost effective. Otherwise there is always a price to pay in terms of resources, material resources, right? The more members you have in a mafia family, the more uh, uh, money you have to pay them every month. The more of them go to prison, the more money you have to spend to support their families, right? Otherwise they'll turn on you. Or the same is true for a, a war, right? Take the Vietnam War. Why did it come to an end? Keep in mind that between the 1960s and the 1970s, until 1975, when the war came to an end, the US dropped more bombs on Vietnam than they had done on Germany during the Second World War. And yet they couldn't win. Lewis? A lot of soldiers. They, the well, of course, right after then, then you have the soldiers, bombs, yeah. which were not as many casualties as during World War II, but even 55, 56,000 dead was too high a political price to pay, right? That became something that impacted on the image of leaders who supported the war to send more and more people to die. And then there is the material cost besides the bombs. Just keep in mind the figure of 6,000. 6,000 were the helicopters, just helicopters that were destroyed, American helicopters destroyed during the war, either because of wear and tear or destroyed by the enemy. Just, just one figure for a war that was never won against an adversary that, of course, was supported materially in terms of supplies by the Soviet Union, but was considered vastly inferior to the mighty Americans. Louis first, and your name, please. Christine. Christine, then. It was also that they just had so many soldiers they had to pay. Like you said, it's resource heavy. The Vietnam War came at the time when the baby boomers were coming. Uh, were, there was a big baby boom. They were all of age. They were all drafted. Yeah, you have as many as half a million people deployed there. Right. But more, more importantly, I would say the, the material costs in terms of planes, helicopters, tanks, vehicles, the bombs themselves, the chemical agents used to defoliate the, the jungle, there was a, an immense waste. And, and of course, I'm not, I'm analyzing this from, from a, a strategic, military, or Machiavellian point of view. Uh, there, is huge, there are huge costs, even in terms of life, lo, lives lost on, on the other side and the damages inflicted on the country of Vietnam. Christine? Yeah, there was, I mean, even like, uh, the United States' own strategy um, was was letting like was letting us down. Like Nixon admitted that just like carpet bombing Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos was doing nothing. And like this is not a, much. Yeah, this yeah. is in a period where like Henry Kissinger like ordered the U.S. military to um, hit anything that moves with anything that flies in Cambodia, which sounds like straight up order for genocide. So it was really just yep. complete um, self sabotage. And that was another political yeah. cost uh, to to see pictures of American soldiers yeah. killing innocent civilians, right? Yeah. To have those images in the media Me lie. was costly. Right. Me lie was indeed a good example. Okay? So, what is the other great intuition in Machiavelli? He was the first to clearly identify that power in the form of control has two manifestations. Control can be indirect or direct. The direct side was the one that had mostly been studied up until that point, during the classical era, during the Middle Ages, in political and military treatises. Everyone understood that power, if you use power to generate control, must rely on the use of force. And I put there force generically, it can be the violence of a single individual 
on another individual, or it can be the deployment of an army, of an entire army, okay? Any kind of use of force. Now, the direct use of force usually gives you power. However, the use of force, as Machiavelli understood and clarified, is resource heavy, right? Of course, during his time, particularly during the Renaissance, most armies, especially in Italy, in a city-state like, such as Florence, but also in Venice, in the Duchy of Milan, the Kingdom of Naples, they relied heavily on mercenaries. And so those mercenaries were costly, right? You had to pay them, pay them well, keep them paying, because otherwise they could betray you or turn on you, okay? And Italy had a lot of resources. Florence was immensely rich. I compared Florence to Switzerland in terms of reserves of cash and gold. However, a lot of resources were wasted, were depleted. The entire Italian economy was depleted by the end of the 16th century. And that explains why Italy in the 1500s is one of the leading countries in all kinds of ways, not just in culture or the arts. And then by the end of the century, Italy plays a secondary role in the European scene or in the global context. So the direct use of force is resource heavy, is costly. I have it costly because resources, I mean material resources, costly can be anything, even affecting your image, okay? As we said before, you could continue fighting against Vietnam but besides the material costs, you have a political price to pay. And probably, at some point, you don't get elected anymore, and you lose the election to a candidate who says, let's put an end to this massacre on both sides. And the use of force, therefore, is usually time limited. You can only use force occasionally. Because again, if you use force all the time, your resources get depleted because in a modern society, you must understand, and Machiavelli did so, the connections between military power and internal growth. If you take too much money out of the economy in order to pay for a big army, then there isn't enough money in the pockets of merchants and entrepreneurs to make their enterprises grow and to generate more money in society, right? Which is how the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. They couldn't continue to pay for their army, for their military, when their economy was stinted, both because of the Marxist infrastructure that was imposed on it, and also because too much of the money produced by the economy went into the military itself, which, in, which instead was only a fraction of the budget uh, in comparison for the United States. So they could sustain that kind of military commitment for a longer period of time, and eventually the Soviet Union collapsed, okay? So the use of force is time limited in a Machiavellian system. What do you need to, what is the best use of, and the most cost-effective use of force, therefore? It is through deterrence. You have an army, you need an army, you need a police force, but then you don't deploy the army, you don't send out the police to arrest people all the time. You just keep them there to scare people away from doing anything that is hostile to the leadership of the country, the leadership of the community, or you keep the army to deter enemies from invading you, okay? Now, of course, deterrence is a Cold War notion, right? Deterrence is what kept the US and the Soviet Union from going to war during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, exactly because both sides were so powerful and both could launch missiles with atomic warheads, and therefore no one could win for sure in a predictable way. 
and therefore they kept from attacking each other. Machiavelli doesn't use the word deterrence. He uses fear in the same way. If you have enough force, you can generate fear. Then, of course, deterrence or fear are deeply connected to your image. Because no matter how powerful your forces are, if you're not a believable leader, if people don't believe that you will attack them, that you will manage your forces effectively, then there is no deterrence, okay? So compare, for example, think of John Fitzgerald Kennedy against Khrushchev in the Cuban crisis of 1963. Kennedy himself projected an image that it was persuasive, convincing enough that Khrushchev refrained from sending Russian ships through the American blockade to deliver missiles to the island of Cuba. Okay, and they had to retreat. It wasn't just the amount of force the, the US Navy or the US Air Force could uh, produce if deployed, it was also how believable the threat of doing so was. And he gambled, right? You are too young. I was born in 1963, and the people around me who remembered those periods, those 15 days of the Cuban crisis, a lot of people in Italy, I'm talking about Italy, I grew up in Italy, a lot of people in Italy believed they were on the verge of a global war. They believed that any day, the world could be at war, or God forbid, atomic bombs could be launched, okay? So you have this, the understanding of the direct use of force. What's really innovative is that Machiavelli understood the other side of political power and control. The indirect use of control which is best defined through the modern label of influence. Under influence, you find some of the traditional Machiavellian practices, for example, lying and manipulating, right? You're not attacking another individual. You're not using violence. You're not threatening violence, but you're telling them something that will force them to behave in a way that you want to achieve your goal or outcome, right? Manipulation happens in the lives of most individuals, and it is especially present in phenomena such as con games, right? Where someone is manipulating you into doing something, giving them money, or doing something to their advantage. Influence can derive from status. Even a celebrity has influence, right? And it is connected to your public image. A politician cannot rely just on force, according to Machiavelli. And this is radically new in that context, in the cultural context. You need to have a plausible image. Otherwise, people will not obey to you and if they don't obey to you most of the time, you'll be forced to deploy police, army, to have your rules enforced, and that'll be costly, and eventually you will lose. You must have some kind of direct or indirect support, even in a dictatorship. Authority is another form of influence, and you understand this better when you think of the symbols associated with authority, forms of authority. Why do policemen wear uniform? They wear uniform exactly because it is not sufficient for them to have a gun. You don't obey policemen, you don't refrain from attacking a policeman, even when you're angry and you come out of, of a bar completely drunk, usually most people will not attack a policeman if they see the uniform. And it's not because the policeman has a gun, but because they recognize the symbolic uh, the, the value of the uniform. 
The uniform is a sign that that person belongs to an organization, which is the expression of a power. And that is what keeps people from doing something or saying something to a policeman. Of course, money, I put that in parentheses, but money, although uh, it, it's, it's a weird way, but money uh, can be applied to generate influence, right? You can spend money, you can bribe people. Uh, uh, if, I, if I was teaching an evening class, I could offer takeout to students every lecture in order to have positive reviews at the end. Can right? you still do that? <laughs> well, I can offer breakfast. Okay. Well, the opposite example is you can offer me money in order to control the outcome of the class. Okay. Yes, but that's illegal. That's Machiavellian, though. Is it? But it's not really a Machiavellian game if you offer me money. Give me just a few, a couple of minutes to finish this. Now, what about influence? Force is resource heavy, costly, and time limited. Influence is resource light. It is mostly connected to skills, though. You really have to have a mind geared towards influence in order to generate influence, right? Even if you just want to become an influencer on Instagram, unlike what you might believe, it is not uh, just about having a physique that can come out well in pictures. There is much more in the construction of a successful influencer of any kind. So you need skills. And it requires a substantial time commitment meaning that you need to keep exercising, reinforcing that influence. Take the example, the most trivial example of an actor, of a singer, who at some point disappears from public life, they stop producing music, or they stop acting in films. How quickly do they lose their influence? Unless this is part of a strategy where I become so well known, but then so, such a recluse that my own segregation, my own isolation, makes other people talk about me. But then I'm not really disappearing, right? Okay, so the Machiavellian game has to have some of these elements. Not all of them, but some of those elements for sure. A Machiavellian act will not match these things. So, why is, let's say, maybe one of these things. Why is the situation where someone cheats their way ignoring the sign that says garage is full monthly only not a Machiavellian game? A quick examination of this, anyone? And then I'll let you go. I was asking you. Based on this. So the person who is cheating his way into the garage just by ignoring the sign, is that a Machiavellian game? Uh, it's not like repeatable, I guess. Like you won't always have that situation. Yeah, it, it's, it's not really repeatable and not predictable mm -hmm. either. In fact, what happened in real life after the episode I witnessed where someone clicked the button. Within a month or two, or two the garage attendant when the garage is full sign was out, would be there telling even to the car lining up, show me your pass. Mm. And if you don't, didn't have a pass, I'd say, go. Yeah. Right? And how much control do you really have of that context? If you're trying just to ignore the rules do you really control the situation? What is beyond your control in that situation? You, you don't control the attendant, right? The attendant could see you and then call the campus police. The campus police could be already there inside the garage around the corner or it could be behind you and you haven't seen them. And again, if they intervene, they can find you. You don't have any control of this. You don't really have any form of power. 
Now, you could generate some influence. You could manipulate the attendant by saying, please, 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 if I miss this exam, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be done. I'm on probation, my, my career will be ruined, I'll be expelled from the university. But is that repeatable? No. You could use influence by giving money to the attendant, right, as a tip. But again, how much control do you have? You can control the attendant, but if the police, you, university police uh, watches this, uh, gets hold of what is going on, you're in even deeper trouble, okay? What happens to the prisoners? Within this context, it is not a Machiavellian game. We can turn it into a Machiavellian game only if you expand the context, but uh, you've been patient enough uh, 